District 74 and friends of District 74. We are now in session number seven. And as per norm, make sure that you get hold of your accountability partners. I know there are issues with network and connectivity, but we will do the best that we can. So welcome to our session number seven. And we will get to talking about what we experienced last week in session number six. And that was coaching conversations to improve team performance. As per the homework requested, we would want to hear from you in the session what your feedback regarding that session was. And thank you to those that are sharing where they're joining us from this evening. Welcome to those that are from South Africa, those from Zimbabwe, Angola, Swaziland, Madagascar is in the house. Those from Mauritius, thank you for joining us. So if you can type in the chat box where you are joining us from. And let us fire away with our feedback regarding conversations. And our friends of District 74, welcome Toastmaster Cindy from Antigua and Barbuda. Zambia is in the house, Botswana is here as well. If you'd want to raise your hand for feedback regarding last week's session. Do I assume those that have unmuted are ready to give their feedback? Toastmaster June, Toastmaster Abel. Coaching conversations. Hundred percent participation, and I don't normally want to pick on people. I would rather you volunteer. What were your learnings from last week, those who managed to attend and those who've been able to catch the replay. Toastmaster Gracious, thank you. Please unmute and go ahead. Thank you so much, Toastmaster Zivai, and good evening, everyone. What an amazing session we had. Definitely. I'm sure we can all agree that the two hours just flew by because, sorry, something happened. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, because he was an amazing facilitator. A few things that really caught my attention. Coaching is the opposite of speaking. And I had to be true to myself. Most of the time when I listen, number one, sometimes if I feel like I know how your story will end, I'll start to give and to formulate my answers, how I want to respond already. So that has been a learning curve for me like this week to be able to literally say, okay, I'm talking to you and I am fully giving you my attention not uh, me already trying to give you advice or answers. Uh, then the second thing, coaching is more of listening. And I learned that it's a skill. I know being a Toastmaster is something, but he just took us to another level of listening, you know, not even wanting you to, to write. Because sometimes I felt like if I write, then it means I'm fully engaged. But listening so that you can understand, it means you can even write afterwards. So yeah, it was really an amazing uh, session for me and loads of takeaways. And I hope that I'll be a better listener and a better coach. Great. Thank you, Toastmaster Gracious, for your feedback and those listening skills. Yes, I caught myself where I was wanting to jot down what someone was saying and then remember what uh, DTM Eric said last week. Toastmaster Francois, you, I see your hand. Please go ahead. 
Thank you so much. Good evening to you. I, sorry, I had to pause this afternoon for me. <laughs> um, two, <laughs> two things. One, just as my previous uh, Toastmaster just said, we have preconceived thoughts when someone is speaking. And the second takeaway for me was the breakout room session that actually helped me after. And uh, I appreciate it a lot. So it means that what it means that we need to move forward. How, how are we speaking to a person? Coaching, um, listening, we need to be careful because we can carry away the wrong, um, wrong impression as well to about the situation. Thank you so much for your feedback, Toastmaster Francois. Over to Toastmaster Lynette. Good evening, everybody. I found last week's session particularly valuable because as the previous speakers have said, it's so easy to fall into the trap of formulating your answer when you're listening to somebody instead of listening for full understanding and only afterwards beginning to, um, to answer based on what you've heard. And it takes effort to, to think about your questions and to ask the people, how does that make you feel instead of why have you done that? And just to internalize that, but, but once you've been made aware of it, and if you print out some of the, the tips and some of the coaching information that Eric shared with us, you can then begin to internalize it and to begin to make sure that your questions are more open questions to the person you're speaking with and allowing them to expand on the answer that they will give you. Great, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you for your feedback. And Toastmaster Gianna says, I realized that the client, Sita, has the answer, himself or herself. You as a coach is the trigger. In fact, silent is equal to listening. Thank you for your feedback. Toastmaster Gajadio, what I learned from that last session is that coaching consists of listening and asking questions, but we cannot be a coach and a speaker simultaneously. When we listen, our mind is busy thinking. The purpose of a coach is to empower people and we never ask why, but we better ask what. For example, we should never say why have you done this better? Say, what made you take this action? This will trigger a thinking process in the mind of the person we are talking to. Thank you for that feedback, Toastmaster Gadgetor. Anyone else with feedback from last week? Toastmaster Nobantu, I see your hand. Please do go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Evening. My greatest takeaway from uh, last week before the storm kicked me out was uh, that the listening and writing. I always uh, believed that when you are right, taking notes of what somebody is saying, it sort of conveyed that you are listening to them. But uh, that theory was totally thrown out from my beliefs last week, and I appreciate it. And that's it. Great. Thank you Great. for your feedback. Then I see in the chat box, highlight was the La Nitra Manga Manga song by Sala Lala. Also, I was humbled by, the, humbled by the understanding of being a mirror instead of a fixer. Thank you, Toastmaster Nutolo. Anyone else want to give us feedback before we move into today's session? Toastmaster Andrew, I see your hand. Please go right ahead. You can unmute yourself. Hi there. Yeah, what I, my great takeaway was coaching is very similar to actually giving a speech. If you think of, it's not all about us. It's about the, the client. 
that you are dealing with. When you're giving a speech, it's basically just what are you delivering to the people? It's about them having their enjoyment. It's not how you feel, it's how they feel. And that to me is quite a powerful feedback because when you're coaching someone, it's it's all about them. It's not about what you're feeling, it's what they are feeling. That's my greatest feedback. Great, thank you for your feedback. Do I see any other hand? Not at this stage. And Toastmaster Rebone, absolutely the song was a highlight for me. So I guess this is going to be one of our theme songs for our executive development program. Toastmaster Mpo says, I actually made a demonstration on asking the why question. They indeed felt like accusations. The people I made a demonstration on said they could tell the difference between asking the why as opposed to asking, tell me more. So that was on coaching conversations. Toastmaster Edith says, my biggest takeaway was that I don't listen as attentively as I thought. I am now mindful of it and it's not about me, but the client. So if we all remember the exercise with the story that was being shared and then the questions thereafter to then say, were we really listening when that story was being read? And it brought quite a bit of a realization even on my part to say, I may not always be listening as attentively as I should. And so that was a great learning experience last week. And once you start applying what you've started learning, you actually find you are becoming a more effective leader as you lead within your club, within your area, within the division, within the district, and even within your community, your family, or your business. Now, the time we've been waiting for for this week, session number seven, analytical thinking and problem solving. Our facilitator, our trainer for today is Kushle Mtembu. He is an integrated adversity preparedness coach, founder and CEO of Impukuko Projects, PTY Limited, as well as managing director of Pan-African Commission of Trade and Development. He has served at Toastmasters International as both an area director, 2020-21, and executive director for the KwaZulu-Natal region, 2021-2022. He has a consulting engineering background and completed his MBA in 2017. While working with major consulting engineering firms like MERS and McLellan, Mott, McDonald, Igoda projects, and many more, he had an opportunity to analyze different companies' performance. Drawing on his vast experience and his trademarked try display system, Kutle transforms his clients to be fully aware of their entire business and organizational environment. Try display assesses your current state, guides you through steps towards your success over the shortest time possible. If you can light up the chat box, your emojis, your hand claps, if your videos are on, help me welcome Toastmaster Kushle to take us through our session number seven, analytical thinking and problem solving. Over to you, Toastmaster Kushle. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, DTM Zivai. You've just made me to feel so, 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 so welcome. And I feel welcome already. Wow. Can everyone switch the cameras for a minute, please? If you can, wherever you are, wherever you are. I just want to see. I need some company where I'm at. Ah, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> They're coming up. They're coming up. All right. All right. All right. Okay. 
I need you to, to do one thing for me. Just turn to your left. No, 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 left, left, left. Can you see anyone? <laughs> right, okay, what we're gonna do, look at the person next to your left and imagine they were sitting here and just look at them and say, I've got a feeling it's going to be a good night. I don't have to hear you. Now let's move to the right. Yes, the one on the right, imagine the one on your right. Yes, and tell them oh, it's going to be a good night. Oh yeah. <laughs> right, we can sing to them now and say, I've got a feeling that tonight's gonna be a good night. That tonight's gonna be a good, good night. Yeah, one more time. And say, I've got a feeling <laughs> That tonight's gonna be a good night. Yeah, tonight's gonna be a good night. I gotta say, it's gonna be a good night. Tonight's gonna be a good night. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love the energy. <laughs> I love the energy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We are all relaxed in and we are getting into it. Eh? Right, let me ask you a question before we go so far. Do you know that we can go for three weeks without eating? three days without water, and three minutes without oxygen. But we can't even go three seconds without thinking. Anyone knows that? Yes. That's what we hear from, uh, I like Dr. Caroline Leaf. That's, a, this is, that's a information that he, she has researched for us, that you can't even go three seconds without thinking. So if we talk about analytical thinking and solving problems, we are indeed talking about thinking. Right, let me just spotlight myself here. Or maybe if the Zoom master can help me spotlight me, whatever they are. Are you already spotlighted? All right, thank you, thank you, thank you. Great, I want to see myself properly this side. Right, if we talk about analytical thinking, and solving problems. We indeed are talking about thinking. So I want us to look at the relationship between the mind and the thoughts. Anyone that wants to volunteer a relationship between the mind and the thought, there's no right or wrong. Please, anyone. I'll suggest if you've got an idea, just go for it without me pointing at you because I won't be able to see everyone here. Yes, go for it. So I thought your thoughts and your mind are the same thing. I think that's why I'm, I'm trying, I'm like hesitant to answer the question because I thought your mind and your thoughts are exactly the same thing. So your thoughts are just the little things that pop into your head, but the mind is like right. the overall thoughts that you have. Am I wrong? I feel like I'm wrong. <laughs> right. Thank you so much, Linda. Was there anyone else that want to try? Yeah. Anyone? <laughs> ah, I see Will Scott. Please go for it, Will. Firstly, thank you for uh, for, for uh, allowing me to have my say. Um, I've heard it put that whereas the thought or the meme uh, is the product of the mind, it is it is more correct to say that it is a mind virus, which is to say it is a compulsive kind of a a, a product of the, the engine that we call our mind. Okay, I love the mind virus. <laughs> I'll take one more. I'll take one more. Melissa? I've always heard people saying your state of mind determines your thoughts. So um, I think your mind is what pushes what you think or what you perceive things to be. 
Yeah. Wow. Well done. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Okay. Let's have a look at this then. Mind is how you think, feel, and choose. That's what it is. Mind is how you think, feel, and choose. And there are three divisions of the mind. We're talking about the conscious mind and the non-conscious mind. And the subconscious mind, which is mainly the information highway between these two main divisions. So if we were to look at it, the conscious is what we're doing now. We are thinking, we're seeing and everything. But the, the non-conscious is under, underground. Picture it being underground. And subconscious is just the highway, information highway that, that is being transported in between. So we are not on the neuroscience class, but it is important to at least appreciate how our minds function. Because when you communicate, when you do that thinking, you need to understand how are you putting things together. A thought is the end product of the mind. I love what Scott said there, he said. <laughs> so, 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 so what's the mind virus? How did you put it? <laughs> A thought is the end product of the mind. In other words, a thought is a real thing that occupies mental real estate. Just like a house will occupy a physical real estate, in a physical real estate, there is a house. Now, in a mental real estate, there's something that will be occupying that space. And that's what we look at as a thought. I want you to picture a tree in trying to figure out how a thought is positioned in your mind, right? I'll give a graphic here just so we look at it. Right, here's a tree. Right at the bottom at the roots, that's where we will be finding the origin story. It will be like the roots. It's way underground. Sometimes we've forgotten even about it. Now, when you look at the stem, that's where our perspectives are at. Our memories that show up as particular behaviors are like branches, and our emotions are like the leaves. That's how it's supposed to look like. Let me move to the side so you can see it. Right at the bottom, we've got the origin story. Sometimes you've forgotten about what took place whenever. But what we tend to see is your perspective. We can read your perspective. We can see your behavior. We can see, we can feel your emotions. Is that okay so far? Do you understand that? Yes. So when it comes to the origin story of where a particular perspective comes from, it is sometimes not displayed. That means you have to dig deep if you want to find that origin story because it's underground. So let's summarize what I've just explained so far. Number one, thought is a product of the mind and it is built into your brain by your mind. Mind and the brain are two separate things. Number two, mind is how you think, feel, and choose. Remember, we did uh, highlight at the beginning that you can't even go three seconds without thinking. So constantly something is happening. And as you think, feel, and choose, you build thoughts with memories into your brain. Brain, which is a physical item now, responds to your mind. You change your brain with your mind. Mind is always, always active. That's my good evening for you. Just to shake your brain a little bit. <laughs> We're not here to do the neuroscience. We're here to be looking at critical and analytical thinking. As you know, we live in a knowledge-based society. And the more critical or analytical you think, the better your knowledge will be. Analytical thinking provides you with the skills to analyze and evaluate information so that you are able to obtain the greatest amount of knowledge from that information. And it provides the best chance of making the correct decision and minimizes the damages if any mistake Okay, That's analytical thinking now. Analytical thinking will lead to being more rational and a disciplined thinker. Analytical thinkers, 
they don't go just haphazard at any given time. It will reduce your prejudice and bias, which will provide you a better understanding of your environment. So tonight, I'd like to provide you with the skills to evaluate, identify, and distinguish between relevant and irrelevant information. It will lead you to being more productive in your career. You will be more productive in your role, wherever you are, and provide a great skill in your everyday life. Does that sound good? Is anyone interested to hearing more about this? Right, our objectives for tonight, let's bear in mind, the study of analytical thinking is something that can take good two days, the way I've taught it before. It can take up to two days, sometimes a day. So we're trying to compress everything into one hour. So let's just tune into understanding that which will be explained and maybe apply the little bit that we will be hearing now. Okay, our objective is to understand the components of analytical thinking. And we also will be looking at the logical thinking. I love that one because last week, uh, what, uh, DTM Eric taught us to ask those good critical questions. That's why we're using our logical thinking. And also we'll look at recognizing what it means to be an analytical thinker. Maybe if we do get a chance, we'll see, we'll identify the benefits of analytical thinking. We may also re revise the perspectives and comprehend and also maybe look at the problem solving, applying the analytical thinking that we'll have learned and apply it to problem solving. Now, as I said last week, DTM Eric gave us some coaching tips and we'll unpack the logical thinking tonight, which goes hand in hand with asking those powerful questions. So in other words, in as much as your client can be asked or your, your subordinate can be asked those critical questions to help them think and find their own solution, you can also do it to yourself by asking certain questions. However, I just want us to start by looking at the components of analytical thinking. Hope we're ready. I would like you to have a pen and a paper somewhere. Judge certain things as you hear them because we will have few of those exercises, the questions that we'll have to answer. And at some point we might need to go to the breakout rooms and have some discussions out there. So please make sure that you jot what, whatever that you hear, but it will be enforced when we're looking at exercises at a later stage. Okay, analytical thinking is related to the study of logic. Analytical thinking relates to how we make decisions and use our judgment. And analytical thinking is more than just thinking about thinking or metacognition. It is also about how we take action. Remember when we started, we said, we mentioned three things there, mind, feels and thinks and does what? And chooses. So it's, it, the analytical thinking is also about how we take those actions. Analytical thinking involves many components and we will address a number of unique components in, in this session. So, okay, the ability to reason is often considered one of the characteristic marks of being a human. Right. This is library supposed to be in on. An individual's ability to reason well is an analytical thinking skill. Many of the definitions of analytical thinking tend to focus on the ability to reason. So reasoning occurs when we use knowledge of one thing, process or statement to determine if another thing, process or statement is true. Let me say that again. The reasoning occurs when we use our knowledge of one thing, process or statement to determine if another thing, process or statement is true. When we apply reasoning, we use logic to determine what follows what. 
Human reasoning does not always follow logic. We know that it's often based on the emotional bias. We human beings, we've got feelings, we feel things. Right, another component is open-mindedness. That's another component. We're still looking at the components of analytical thinking. We've looked at there, applying reasoning. Now we're looking at open-mindedness. And this one is a virtue by which we learn open-mindedness. You know, if, if you picture a child, they're open-minded, they're still open to hearing anything and they learn quicker. In particular, being open-minded means taking into account relevant evidence or arguments to revise a current understanding. It means being critically open to alternatives, willing to think about other possibilities even after having formed an opinion and not allowing your preconceived notions to constrain or inhibit on the new information that is being presented. You know, you do come across people that are so fixated. They just know this one particular thing. They're not open-minded. So open-mindedness is when we are willing to be looking at other possibilities out there, even though we know what we know. Open-minded inquiry is a central theme of education. That's what we use when we learn. Right, we move on. In analytical thinking, the step of analysis helps us to discriminate and access information. Now, learning occurs in three main domains. There is cognitive domain, that is the mind. There is affective, which mainly will be touching on the feelings. And there's also psychomotor, which is relating to the motor actions. In cognitive domain, analysis involves the process of discriminating or separating. It gives us the ability to break down the complexity of any item or idea and allows us to gain a better understanding. Well, there's also logic and reasoning, which are almost similar, which are similar, but they're not the same. Logic is a branch of philosophy that gives the rules for deriving valid conclusions. A conclusion is valid if it follows from the statements that are accepted as facts. Let's make an example. The logic will be looking at one plus one equals what? Two. This is a rule based on the fact. One plus one can never equal anything. It equals two. Only in one occurrence that I know, one plus one equals 10, where there is synergy. <laughs> <laughs> but that's something else. We're not talking of logic in that, in that state. Factual statements are called premises. When reasoning does not follow the rules, we say it is illogical. If there are certain rules that we are thinking they're supposed to be being followed and they're not being followed, uh, uh, that reasoning is illogical. Right. I want us to take a moment now and just look at some questions. Let's do this. I did say we're gonna to have to write. <laughs> I just want us to take a moment and look at the questions. Try and answer these questions as quick as possible. Number one, the reasoning occurs when we use our dash of one thing to determine if another thing, process or statement is true. Write it somewhere on your paper. Okay, what is syllogism? Does everyone pick the answer? Can we move on? I've got about six to eight questions. All right, I can see on the chat, people are just answering there.
Okay, question number three. What does it mean to be open-minded? Oh, some people are... Okay, for those that say they can't read, obviously for the next exercise, we'll go out into breakout rooms. There will be some case studies as well. I will be attaching some document where you will be reading better. For now, it's just for us to get going. Right. Yes, question number five. Right, moving right along. Question number seven and question eight. Right, I think that's about it on, the, on my questions. Right. Okay, anyone that wants to volunteer and give me their answers, please. Don't have to raise your hand. Just get on it and let's start talking about it. What was the answer for question one? Question one was Hi. this one. Yes. It's Alia speaking. So yes. for question one, I said the answer was C. Okay, why? Give me one second. I just need to see it again. <laughs> I said that with regards to when talking about applying um, any reason using the knowledge that you have in order to make a decision or follow through. Yeah, that, that's correct, that's correct. Right, number two, anybody else? Hello. You have it, you can... Yes, go ahead. Statement go that says things occur in relation to each other based on a certain order. And that was uh, what? Is it C statement? Okay. That is B. That is B. Okay, B. That's what? the correct answer. Why? Do you have any reason that led you to that? I just think that that's the correct answer. It's the best one that I can read out of what's going on here. <laughs> okay, syllogism is when two or more premises are used to come to a valid conclusion. So the premises are factual statements used for this kind of logical reasoning. So the answer there is A, when two or more premises are used to come to a valid conclusion. But thank you so much for participating. Answer for three. Uh, the, the three was this one. It is C. Three is C. Three C. Why? Yeah. Willingness yes. to accept it's open. I mean, you are open minded. You are willing to learn and unlearn also. Okay, great. The correct answer is C for three. Right, number four, anybody? Just go for it, anyone. Uh, it's Marlies. I'll go for D, Socrates. Right. Okay. Yes, that's correct. That answer is D. And number five. Uh, 
I'll say C, cognitive. Okay, C. Right, just, just give us a reasoning behind. What did we say earlier on? Why is it C? Because learning has to do with cognitive abilities. Okay, right. Okay, remember we did say that learning occurs in three domains. It is co cognitive, affective, and psychomotor. Cognitive is the thinking part, affective, the emotional part, and psychomotor, that action that you will be taking. Right, answer for number six. For number six, I would argue that none of the above. <laughs> Give me a reason, sir. <laughs> Because the one that I would take out, if I just jump into it, it will be language. But language envelops so much of what we understand, which informs our arguments, which informs what we regard as evidence, which brings other dynamics of the environment that we are in. So I think all of these are the factors that one needs to consider when analyzing new information. Okay, okay. Anyone else that wants to oppose with the answer given? Any other opinion? Yeah, I would like to give it a step. As Hello? None of the above. Yes, I, I can hear you, go for it. Yes, uh, when I first read this one, my, I was incl inclining towards A as the one which is not one of the three factors when analyzing new information. Just because if information is new, I believe you want to take it as new at face value and an argument is something that probably comes in the letter. Okay. That's why. And what are we choosing as a result? You also are choosing I'll nothing. The one which is not a factor to consider is A, which is argument. So there are argument. three, B, C, and D are uh, to be considered. <laughs> Let me give my thoughts on this one because I can see uh, th this one has got various uh, varying opinions. It's C. The answer that I chose is C. Why? Because when listening to new information, Socratic process considers the argument evidence and language. So the environment is not one of the three factors. The factors that are there is argument, evidence, and language. However, let's go right along and let's see as we process, uh, pro progress, how are we going to find other information from what we're looking at tonight? Number seven, anybody? It is rules, seven A. Seven is A. Yeah. Yes, seven A rules, it's according to pr pr principles, legislations, well established. Okay. All right, anyone else? Um, I think seven is C. I mean, is conclusion, sorry. It's either conclusions or premises. I think, again, words that sound right. similar to one another mess with me. Okay, we're going to reiterate on that one. Uh, the correct answer there is D. Logic involves rules, premises, and conclusions. However, it is not these things. It is a branch of philosophy that states the rules for reaching a valid conclusion. Hmm. Yes, it does state those things, but it is a branch of philosophy somehow. It does include those things though. And number eight. I would say eight is a, a statement of fact or value. I, I'm not okay. sure, but I'm in, I'm in towards A. <laughs> Do you have any reasoning behind that? Well, you know, like, in, I don't even know how to explain it. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but yeah, a premise is what you kind of like start with and then you put them together. They, they make something in terms of logic or illogic. Yeah. 
Anyways, yeah. Great, great. It, the, it is A. Premises affects the statements that allow a logical conclusion to be inferred. So it is correct. Well done, well done to everyone. Well done. Actually, when I look at your answers here, I mean, it's only three that we couldn't get, which is two, six, and seven. So yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm really impressed. So let's move along then. Now, we're looking at logic thinking. Logical thinking is a process which involves four steps. In general, logical thinking, it involves checking the components of the argument and making the connections between them, which is what we call reasoning, right? The four major steps in logical thinking are asking the right questions. That's what we we're looking at last week. And once we've asked those right questions, we've got to organize the data and start evaluating the information and then draw conclusions. So what we do, we ask the right questions, we organize that data, we evaluate the information, then we draw conclusions. That's logical. In this section, we will analyze these basic steps. The first step in logical thinking should begin with asking the right questions. What do we mean when we say we're asking the right questions? Based on the components of analytical thinking, the logical thinker should begin reasoning by asking many, many, many more questions. It's more like being curious, you know, I like the tips that we got from Titi and Eric last week. I use them a lot when I deal with, with my clients at the coaching sessions. You, you begin to be more curious. So you can be curious on yourself as well. Why should this happen? What comes next? What if that? You did give us the tips of how to ask the questions, which was really, really great. An important question to ask is what are the premises? because you need to establish the premise every time you ask the question. If we are confused about the premises, we may take, or we may actually make a lot of mistakes further down in the line in the logic process, because really we just don't have the basis we, we understand it incorrectly. You think something took place in Devon while it took place in Cape Town, you know? So the premise, the, the, the most foundational thing is out. We should distinguish between whether a statement is fact or a value. What should or ought to be the case, or maybe and be allowed to confuse the two. We shouldn't confuse the two items. Finally, we should check to see if any premises or vital information is missing. A key point to remember is that no conclusions can be made without premises. If your premises is out, there is no conclusion that we're ever going to make. Now we move on to organizing the data. Organizing the data is a second step in logic process. Once we know the premises, we can begin to organize the data. We can organize the information by making connections. An effective method of organizing data includes breaking up the information and diagram or laying out the premises. There is a diagram that I like to use. You saw me, I used the tree diagram when we started. Tree diagram are helpful because they graphically show the connections. Remember at the leaves, we did see that that's where there's emotions taking place and the perspective is somewhere on the stem and underground and the root, that's the origin story, which sometimes is deeper to find. So you, you can use that graph, that tree diagram to start making the connections because that's what more likely the, the mind will see, right? After organizing the information, uh, we, we just have to be full here. Yeah. After organizing that information, the logical thinker can proceed with evaluating. 
Evaluating information involves determining whether the information is valid. Conclusion cannot be made until a distinction is made between the truth and validity. It's important to get those separated. People often have trouble separating what is valid from what is true because of their ingrained beliefs. Remember, <laughs> we've got our own beliefs, but we chuck that aside when we evaluate. Belief bias occurs when an individual's belief system interferes with the ability to come to a logical conclusion. Confirmation bias is the tendency to use information to support your hypothesis about a problem. Right. Once the data has been collected, once the data, we've collected the data now, organized and evaluated, we can then draw conclusion after we've gone through all these stages. Recall that in deducive reasoning, conclusions are inferred based on the valid premises. So we said, with the wrong premise, you cannot go ahead. In, in, in inducive reasoning, we use observations to draw conclusions or a hypothesis. Interferences naturally flow from the evidence. In making in, in inferences, the logical thinker should be certain not to draw more or less than what is implied instead. So I think at this point, I will try to get us into the breakout rooms. We'll be looking at the exercise that's the same as what we looked at earlier. And we will try and answer those questions. OK, we're trying to attach. Before you move to your breakout room, please make sure that you take the question that will be there on the chat box and go to the breakout room. I don't know if the Zoom master can assist me to have about yes. 22 to 23 breakout rooms, please. OK. Uh, before they go away, though, we, we just need to attach the questions. We can also be able to send the questions as a broadcast message after the fact, but it's also great to have them in the chat, yes. All right. Okay. They should be there now, or they should be coming. Once you've got the questions, go to your breakout room. Uh, we are locating something like 10 minutes. And in those groups, please, you will be presenting, you will be giving us a, a little presentation of how you came up to those answers. And there is a case study as well. And you will be giving us a presentation on that. Okay, opening the rooms now. Thank you.
Who's leading us in our group? Uh, Selena, in the breakout um, room in which in, in the breakout room in which I was, I posted the question. Uh, I think it was number eleven. Okay. Should we? Let me also I can, just. Send... I can probably go around to the different breakout rooms and just see whether everybody is okay. Okay, I think let's do that. Okay, so are you? Or should I do that, and you remain in the main room? Oh, okay. Uh, do you know if Sigrid wanted to go into the breakout rooms? Zivai also, do you know if they wanted to go into them? Because also, I didn't expect them to also land in the rooms. Okay. I thought the co-host would stay in the main session. I think the host, the host can assign the co-hosts to rooms if the host does it. If the co-hosts try it, I think it won't work. Okay. Oh, no, I, I, I made it that... Um, it assigns automatically, but somebody in room 11 is asking for help. So I think we should go in there and I think see. that's where I was. Um, oh, okay. I'll join it again and just check. Oh, okay, great. Okay, how are we feeling, everybody? Is it still a good night? <laughs> It's gonna be a good day. We should not quit our day jobs. We can't sing. <laughs> Beautiful. How was the exercise? Was it good? Interesting. Hard. Mind boggling. Hard. No, 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 no. As soon as you say hard. Mind boggling. <laughs> I thought it was interesting and right. it was good. There was just not, not enough time to fill out all the answers. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so often.
right. Who's we sending the questions? Okay. Yes, somebody is. Mm. <laughs> we could try maybe to mute the, that person. Yeah, afterwards, there will be. All right. We can't hear you. Yes, I think you accidentally unmuted it. Yes, there. Okay, okay. All right, I'm audible now. So yes, I just would like some people to present. Which room would like to start? Give me the room number and you take us through. I don't know what room number we were, but I, we can go first. Okay, I'll give yourself maybe, a name. Maybe before we go first, could we just have the bio break now um, so that we then right. start on the questions when we come back? That's fine. I'm happy with that, uh, Spy. Thank you so much. What time are we coming back? If we could have a four minute bio break so that we are back by quarter past seven. And then we, we pick right. up the, the feedback from there. Thank you so much. All right, we'll Thanks. see you in 1915. Have test tubes. We have test tubes because we have asked what we have. We have four beakers with four liquids. We have a flask with a reagent that activates the colors. The other four, the four beakers have colorless liquids. So that's what we have. But we work within the premise that a lab has got test tubes. So our way of thinking is that we don't know what liquids are there. So we will have to test how each of the liquid reacts. Firstly, each liquid, need, we need to find out if it's not just one liquid that reacts and gets the pink color. So we'll use test tubes to test one, two, three, four separately with the reactive, with the activating agent. If that is not it, we will yeah. go to one and two, two, one and three, one and four. So we'll go to all the possible combinations, notwithstanding the fact that it could be one, two or three liquids together with the activating agent. So we'll do as many combinations as need be. And if we are also considering quantities, then we'll have to go even further with our testing. That was our reasoning and our process of thinking. Okay, thank you. And on the questions, one, what was your answer? We're not going to justify, you just give me one was this, two was that. What questions? We did not get any further questions than that one. Okay, that you, was you couldn't move on to, to the, any other the, the multiple choice. No. All right, that's fine. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pumeza. And let's see, Reboni. Thank you so much uh, for, for, for the assignment. We are in a lab. In our team, we thought, okay, so we use the colors of the rainbow first, the strongest one. And we thought of the five of the four basic question, uh, colors that are stronger. And we thought of red, blue, yellow, and green in the big, meaning that we will have those as the basic questions. Um, uh, colors. And we have white as a reagent and we poured white into red and then white into blue, white into yellow, white into green. And then ultimately we'll have a pink from a combination of pink and red. And that gave us a, the answer. So our combination is the reagent is white, that is neutral, and it gave us a pink color, a combination of red and white. That's how we, get, we got to pink. Okay, if I get you correct, you are given four beakers of colorless liquids labeled one to four, and yeah. you are given a flask labeled X. So where exactly are you going to be mixing that uh, flask labeled X? Will it be with a two? Will it be with a three? Will it be with a four? With the, I just need well, to get clarity on your... 
so we've got X as, as the color white. And then we have one is yeah. red, two is blue, three is yellow, four is, is green. Then we have a reagent okay. white poured into one, into two, into three, into four. Okay, okay, interesting. Wow. <laughs> All right, Onika. Oh, uh, before you go, uh, Riboni, were you able to get to the multiple choice section? No, we didn't. We were at the lab. We were still figuring out, but we got an answer that says pink. How will you determine which combination Great. we got through that? Yes. Right, okay. Yeah, go for it, Onika. Thank you. I'm from room number nine. When we got to the lab, we appreciated the lecture's effort for the case study. We are not chemistry students right. and we're not exposed to chemistry. We all look at each other right. and we ask each other, you start, you mix. And <laughs> nobody wanted to start. So we thought, the labeling here, it's not clear. We don't wanna mix anything and, and blow ourselves or blow the building or change someone to an animal. And we decided okay. as chemistry amateurs, the instruction should have come yeah. with more additional information such as measurements, and if possible, those measurements like spoons, if they use spoons in the lab. So we decided we're not doing this. We are not ready to die. We would like to continue being Toastmasters. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So you just abandoned the exercise. Were you able to do the multiple choice at least? No, we, we didn't get to the multiple choice. Okay. <laughs> One card. <laughs> Go for it. Oh, gosh. Which name you called? Oh. Fran Francois. Okay. Oh, Francois. <laughs> yes, Francois. Okay. Oh, Fran my group, okay. my group, the first, I said to them, I remember when we looked on the question, I said, you know, I remember chemistry. So this is a hypothesis question. And we went straight to the multiple choice. And so, <laughs> so um, for the multiple choice, answer one, we have D. For number two, okay. B. For number three, D. It's B. Uh, come again, number two is B, eh? Number three, D, capital D. D, okay. Number what was number two? I missed number two. Oh, two, B. B as in Bravo. B, okay, for brother. Correct. Okay. Number four, B as in Bravo. Okay. Number, number five, C. Number six. Right. Number six, we had to rush for time when we saw the time was coming down. So we went to seven, which is A. Number eight, right. C, as in darling. Number nine, the letter C. And the number 10, the letter D, as in darling. Okay, what was your number eight? Uh, I missed eight. Is it darling as well? Darling, yes, D. And number six, what, what was the letter? Oh, we saw the time and we just dropped quickly. So I, I'm going to, okay, I am going to, yeah, I'm going to put in my own answer because we jumped so fast. I would say it's, oh, no, no, it's um, right, right, right. all right. Uh, I will take one, one, two, three, four. All right. Let's take Lisa. Um, good evening, everyone. We were in room two, and these are our answers. Number one, we had D. Number two, A. Number three, D. Number four, B. Okay. Number five, C. 
number six d that's as far as we could go with the time that we had mm, okay right interesting <laughs> uh Tadzai. thank you thank you very much and um, i represent i represent uh team penny and um yari for the column pink um our, yeah. our, our, um, our conclusion was that it doesn't matter which uh, flask you pick from one to four. Any one of them would uh, right. produce the, the pink color if you add um, the, other, um, the other flask. And then with respect to those other questions, the multiple choice, I think we may have missed those questions in the chance in the chat as we didn't see them, so we didn't get an opportunity to to address them. Okay, so it doesn't matter on the color. It does. It doesn't matter. You can mix with with any from one to one to four. Right. Okay. Thank you for that, Dylan. Uh, good evening. So I was from room twenty with Will and Marie. We thought that being since that we were in a chemistry lab, we had uh, we had 24 beakers that we could have used to make various combinations, and that would have brought us right. to, to the color that we were supposed to have. So that that was what we got on on the first uh, question or the first uh, the statement that was there. So the, the answer is we've got 24 beakers, or you've got four beakers. Now we have four beakers with the different liquids in okay. it, but the fact that we're in a That's chemistry right. lab, we deduce that we can yeah. make use of other beakers and do various combinations of these four liquids that would result in us getting the desired color. Okay, by doing that, are you not going outside of the premises that you've been given? What do you think about that? Not necessarily, there weren't any rules laid down, so we just deduced that we could use other beakers and make those various combinations that would bring us to a desired uh, color. Okay, how are you der deriving that premise of going outside what the information that you've been given? I yes. I'm coming yes. back to you, Dylan, because it's interesting the way you're thinking of it. <laughs> All right. Yeah, keep going. How, how did you make that conclusion that, okay, we, we can go outside of what we've been given here? The fact that there weren't necessarily any stated rules to say how to go about this. So we based it that this okay. is a chemistry lab. There are obviously other beakers within this lab. Let us make use of them. Instead of limiting right. ourselves okay. to the four that we there. All right. <laughs> Interesting. I'll take three more so that we can move on to, to the problem solving. Uh, Elka. Okay. Good evening, everyone. We were in room 14, Nancy, Estella, and N. Wabisa. And we tackled the multiple choice questions first, and those okay. were what we had the opportunity to complete. For question one, we had C, two, okay. we had A, three, we okay. had B, four, we had D. Uh, come again. Three. Three is a D. No, B as in boy. B. Okay, B, all right. Keep four. Going. B. B. Five is C. Five is C. And six is D, as in David. Six seven. Is D, yes. Seven is C. Right. Eight. B. E. Nine. C. Ten. A. Nine, 10 A. Well done. Okay, Thank you. we'll see how it goes soon. Right. Uh, my apologies. I won't take as many now. I'll just take Naomi and we see it. Go for it, Naomi. Okay. Good evening. 
I was in room 22 with my brother from Madagascar and my sister from Antigua. We looked at the, at the oh. case study and realized there was so much information we needed and we're not chemists. So we went straight to the multiple choice questions. Number one, we chose D. <laughs> okay. And number two, we chose B. Number three, D. Four, B. Okay. Five, C. Six, D. Seven, A. 8D, 9C, 10D. 10D, wow, okay. Well done to everyone. The whole objective here was to try the exercise. Thank you so much for everyone that uh, attempted any question, whether you tried the actual case study, whether you went to the multiple choice. It's just so we activate that logical thinking capacity. Right. We'll first look at the case study. I will only zoom into two things that we are given because we are practicing thinking logically. I'm given one to four and I'm given X. What is letter X towards the end of the alphabet, alphabetical order? X, Y, Z. So W, X, Y, Z. Where is X fitting in that order? W, X, Y, Z. What number is X fitting? Is it number two in this two. order? Two. 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 Yes. Right. two. Aha, we don't know what information is there, but the first test that we're making, let's go to number two. X, let it go to two, because we're trying to see the logic that took place when they were coming up with this. But there's no right or wrong answer. It's all great answers that I got. I'm just sharing my logic that will have worked. There's four numbers, okay? One, two, two, four. Where are we sitting in the alphabetical order? All right, which was the end then we're corresponding that X with number two. How does that sound? Anyone that wants to challenge me? <laughs> Not me. Right. It's too dry. Not you, okay. Um, <laughs> Don't worry. Um, I'm going yes. to take you on with that. Take me I'm, on, please. <laughs> I'm going to take you on with that, I'm afraid. Um, your, your logic, uh, assumes too much for me so yes you were saying <laughs> from the four from the back of the alphabet nowhere in your in your premise was the alphabet mentioned nowhere in your premise was the number one two three four applied or attributed to anything therefore you are taking that okay. on faith which is exactly what yeah, my yes, team I did when faith. we assumed that a lab was full of Speakers, where we could apply solid statistical evidence to empirically prove your point. So yes, I will choose to okay. uh, take you on that, and um, I will respectfully agree to disagree with you. No, 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 no. It's fine. There's no right or wrong. <laughs> I also don't have the right answer. I also looked at that problem, which I pulled out from the net. I said, this is a great question, actually, for the exercise for today. But that was my logic. Remember, I have to use the premise that I have. I, I have to use the premise that I have. For me, maybe for, because of my background, looking at four numbers and looking at where am I fitting with those letters, okay, probably. Remember, that's not the only thing I will do, but that's what I will, I will test first. That's where I will go first to say, let's see what happened here. All right, anyone else? in a minute that wants to challenge me. <laughs> I love it if it's like that. It means we yes. really are using our minds. Yes, I wanted to actually challenge you as well because from your own premise, you're starting from an alphabet, you're looking at where you are, yeah. you are at the back end. What makes you then start from W and not start from Z, Y, X, W, then that makes your X number three. 
I take you, I take that. Yes, that's a, that's a very nice logic I'm getting. What makes me not to reverse backward? Because if I want to use that, I should be reversing backward. But I think we're getting the point. We're getting the point of what the exercise wants. Now let's look at the answers that we have for, for the multiple choice. Try and mark yourself there. I, I won't spend too much time. I'll just read them through as, as I go along. Okay, for question one, the answer is D there. Asking questions, let me do this. Okay, so we all can see what is happening. Right. Okay, question one is D. Asking question is the first step in the logic process. Logical thinkers ask the right questions to lead to solutions. So I see Francois got it right and Lisa got it right together with Naomi and many others, I'm sure. Number two is A, logical thinkers should begin with asking many questions. The most important question they should ask is, what are the premises? The other answer question are also important and maybe included in the premise as well. But you start by asking as many possible questions as you possibly can. And the answer for number three was D, convergent. Let's go ahead and show D number three, yes. Convergent structure begins at the starting point and provides premise that support each other. Variances will not appear in a convergent structure. Right, I see some people got it right there. Right, number four is B. Three diagrams are graphical devices that make it easier to interpret information. Remember your brain thinks and pictures. So the answer is uh, B, B on number four. Right, if we move along number five, the answer is C. Confirmation bias is when you use a premise to support what you already believe. It is used to confirm opinions. And number six is D, validity is, the, is based on the premises. A conclusion is considered valid if it's true because its premises are true. Then we're looking at uh, number seven is A. What was the question? What is one risk involved in drawing conclusion? Okay, draw more from the premises. Logical thinkers should be careful not to draw more from the premises than what is there. I think whoever that challenged me there is right. <laughs> I'm making more than what is there. So the correct answer is A there, right? Number eight is D. When drawing conclusions, logical thinkers should do three things. They should infer only what the data implies. Check for consistencies and identify underlying assumptions. And number nine, obviously C, I think a lot of us got that. And number 10 is D. I knew that on that one, we'll, most of us will be taking a guess. Right, was that interesting? Okay, I would like to quickly touch on problem solving and let's see how far can we go with that with the few minutes that we have. Unfortunately, we're no longer going to be able to uh, take any exercise when it comes to that. Okay, a major function of analytical thinking. Am I, uh, yeah, we're showing. A major function of analytical thinking gives us the ability to solve problems. Regardless of our vocation or profession, we may be presented with something that we don't even know, but we are able to solve problems if we are analytical thinkers. In this section, we'll learn more of the steps of solving the problems. Some psychologists define a problem as a gap or a barrier between where the individual is at and where they wish to be. That gap is what is called a problem. 
In other words, a problem is the space between point one and point B. If we don't know how we're going across to that, that becomes our problem. And as analytical thinkers, we need to be able to solve that type of a problem. Okay, all possible solution paths leading to the goals state are located in the problem space. All possible solution paths leading to the goal state are located in the problem space. Some researchers say that a problem solving has three primary stages. Stage number one is preparation and familiarization. You've got to prepare and be familiar with the problem that you're trying to solve. Number two is production and number three, judgment and evaluation. Now, much of analytical thinking is about how to connect the two points in a problem. However, sometimes analytical thinkers are presented with inconsistencies, just like how we've seen. There were some inconsistencies that we're seeing, or what scientists call cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance can appear through a discrepancy between the attitude and beliefs. Inconsistencies can also be called variances or dissimilarities. That cognitive dissonance, there's something that I'm already thinking about, there's something that I know, but what I'm seeing, I'm not agreeing with it. No. It, is natural, it, it is a natural tendency actually to want to eliminate inconsistencies when solving a problem. The best way critical thinkers can identify inconsistencies is by using their logic and objectivity to see those variances. Identifying the inconsistencies will fall under the first stage of problem solving in which we are familiarizing ourselves with the subject. Well, another thing that you need to be doing when you're trying to solve your problem, trust your instincts. You saw there, my instinct just told me that, okay, I need to be looking at X corresponding with, num uh, with number two. Trust the instinct, something, say something, try and follow that because most of the times you'll find that as you continue to test, something will come out, out of that as well. So trust your instinct, fall under the second stage of problem solving. And you should now start to see the solution paths. Remember, you familiarize yourself with the problem. And now there is an instinct that is drawing you towards this. Instincts are defined as a natural intuitive power. Intuition or instincts are key pieces in problem solving. When coupled with trial and error, informed guesses and brainstorming, intuitions and instincts can lead to a highly, highly creative process. Well, we've seen many scientists, they've discovered and they've done the inventions. And these inventions were made because the innovator followed their instincts. Yeah. I mean, if you look at Thomas Edison and uh, there's many. At the first instance, they didn't know what is what. They just followed their instinct and started testing that after they followed a particular instinct. So it's very important to follow the instinct and start testing the information having followed that. In a previous session, we discussed how asking the right question is important in logical thinking. Asking why is equally important in problem solving. It is not sufficient to be simply presented with the information or data. Analytical thinkers must always be willing to dig deeper. Didn't you talk about that when we started? Digging deeper and expose various possibilities. Asking why can fall under any of the three stages of the problem solving that we've just listed. I think we will stop here for tonight <laughs> before we blow our minds. We'll stop here for tonight, and I will be sending those questions through by, and keep on trying to answer those questions. It will help you to embed the message that we, we've been talking about. If there's any question, I'm available. Uh, 
Okay, my email address is shown here. I'm available at any given time. And with that, thank you so much. Back to you, Zvaya. Thank you so much to our facilitator for today, Toastmaster Kuhle Mtembu, taking us through analytical thinking and problem solving. And for me, the analytical thinking, I used to think I am someone who's analytical, having gone through um, the leadership styles and the communication styles in the Pathways program. But after today, just those questions and getting to think about the colors and the beakers, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going back to my chemistry days, decades ago. It was actually fun um, as well. So even in the moments of learning, we are doing it in a safe environment. And also we are having fun whilst we are doing it. But for others, it could have been maybe a bit stressful. And with session number eight coming up next Saturday, um, the 20th of November, we will be having a session on time and stress management. And I'm sure some of us, well, me personally, I'm looking forward to going through next week's session so that I'm able to manage some of the stress factors in my life right now. We've had 10 hours of load shedding and all the backup power gadgets all running out of power and you need to come up with a plan B because there's no way you're going to say to the people that you are serving, I can't do this because of the challenges I'm faced with. So I'm thoroughly enjoying this program as we continue to build each week. And so like if you looked at last week's session on coaching conversations and today Toastmaster Kutle also talked about the kind of questions that we are needing to also ask as we are thinking analytically in what we are doing as leaders. So if you can light up the chat box, I know some of you have been posting your thanks. Um, let's share those emoticons Let's give um, a round of applause, just as our thanks to Toastmaster Kutle. I know the time that he took preparing to come and be with us from even the bio that I read, getting something like this just for your time and your data without having to pay because you are a Toastmaster and you are on this program, we really, cannot over emphasize or just the gratitude and the thanks that we have for the industry experts that are coming through each week and just being dedicated to giving us their best. So thank you so much to Toastmaster Kushle for coming out this evening. And at this stage, I'll ask our Zoom masters to take our photos. So if you've got um, your camera, your video off, please do start your video so that we can have our photo session. And when our Zoom masters are done, please do let me know. And you won't know when it's coming to your page. So keep that permanent smile on. Keep on smiling. <laughs> if you want to do a happy one, do go right ahead and do that. <laughs> I'm on page two now. <laughs> oh, people on page two, if you know where you are, and those on page yeah. one. Okay, let's see. I think the people on page three doesn't have their video on. Okay. 
And Toastmaster Edith is asking if we've got an assignment for this week. Thank you for that prompt. Toastmaster Kushle, are you giving us any homework, any assignment, or are you saying the exercises you were giving us really got us all thinking? I have attached the third assignment. Keep trying that. We can talk about it on the email that I've just shared. I have attached it. Maybe I need okay. to attach it again. All right, if you can attach it again, and if you can also share it with me, then I'll share it with all the participants, even the ones that um, dropped out because of connectivity. Yes, okay, I will do that. So Toastmaster Edith, there you have it. You do have some more thinking to do just to cement what we covered today. Our Zoom masters, are we happy with our photo session? I got the number of photos. Thanks, Eva. Great. Thank you, Toastmaster Bertis. And thank you, Toastmaster Selina, Toastmaster Sigrid, for continuing to support our lead executive program. So as we continue to empower, we are saying lead, empower, accelerate, and develop. So please keep up coming on to the sessions. We are getting closer and closer to the finish. And just also as a reminder, the Toastmasters District 74 YouTube channel now has the videos uploaded of the previous sessions. And so if you'd also want to go there instead of going to the Google Drive, you can do that as well. Thank you so much. And at exactly 1955, our meeting is adjourned. See you next week. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.